Okay, so hot topics in gastro. So, um, Sula, the, one of the, the team said uh, that you had provided some feedback as to what topics you'd like us to discuss. Um, as I said, gastro is quite varied um, and a whole list was sent. Um, obviously, trying to cover everything in one hour is going to be challenging, but I'll try my best to sort of focus on the important areas. And then even if we finish a bit early, we can go into the questions and then we can always come back if time remains uh, to see if we can highlight any of the more important uh, subtopics. And also, um, I, I've done a few videos which you probably have already seen. We could go through those again, or you could just go home when you have some time and have a look at those. When it comes to the other things are esophageal dysmotility, like um, nutcracker esophagus or jackhammer esophagus. Those are more if you're doing a SCE exam in uh, gastroenterology, it's useful to know about them. So go, the other important thing, which is quite common in the UK when it comes to um, is, is esophagus is isnophilic esophagitis. I mean, uh, uh, I don't think we hear much about that in India or abroad, but it is relatively common in the UK. So what happens is in esophageal esophagitis is patients who are uh, predisposed to this condition or risk factors are people with atopic asthma or eczema. Uh, these people have difficulty in swallowing. They sometimes have um, um, dysphagia. And they also have what they also present to hospital with um, esophageal foreign body or food bolus impactation. And what happens is if you go into the esophagus with an endoscope, you can see that there's, there's furrows, there's whitening, there's exudates um, and um, infiltration of the esophagus with eosinophils. So that's why it's called eosinophilic esophagitis. So the treatment initially is to, that some of this is caused due to the acidity. So you treat it with PPIs. The, um, the other treatment is to, to treat it locally with steroids, and that can be done either with an inhaler, which you actually swallow, or you can use it with steroids like budesonide, which helps in reducing the inflammation. Essentially, if there are um, eosinophils more than 15 per high power field, then you say it's eosinophilic esophagitis. They can also develop strictures as a complication, in which case um, dilatation endoscopically can be achieved as well. Um, a lot of things um, in the UK, uh, a lot of emphasis is placed on cancer. So we have a whole two week wait uh, program or assessment where we assess patients uh, quite quickly once they're pre um, presented to their GP or general practitioner uh, or family doctor, as it said, um, with red flag symptoms. So it's always important to learn for the MRCP or even for your clinical practice and part two, is that um, what are the red flag symptoms or red flag signs that people have that would merit investigation for cancer? So if you go to upper GI cancer or esophageal malignancy, what are the red flags? So you can, swallowing difficulty is a red flag in itself. Hematemesis, bringing up blood, um, loss of weight, appetite loss. Um, so those are the things that are considered as red flag symptoms. And then obviously sudden on um, a resistant esophageal reflux is, an, is another one. So when it comes to esophageal malignancy, the most common <coughs> sorry, is esophageal adenovirally these days. Gastric malignancy is another important um, malignancy that's found in the stomach. It's more common in um, the Eastern world, probably related to H. pylori, especially in Japan and Korea, but in the UK, it, when it is diagnosed, it is quite late. So again, symptoms would be abdominal pain, appetite loss or weight loss, um, anemia is also important. Iron deficiency anemia, is, an, as a, is another high yield topic. And these are investigated by, if you get iron deficiency anemia, which is microcytic anemia, 
patients have low ferritin. Um, and if there's any doubt, you can do a um, hematinics, which will look at iron and transferrin saturations and iron indices. So that's a high yield topic that you need to read about. And that again has been discussed elsewhere. So those are the important topics for the, the top end. We'll just move down slightly lower into the, let's go to the malabsorption. This is something that you wanted us to um, discuss. Uh, so good, evening, really, sir. good evening, sir. Yeah. Uh, may I interrupt? Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, I'm a little bit confused regarding the differentiation between esophageal carcinoma and Barrett's esophagus. Will you please yeah. uh, take... Uh, uh, yes, take yes, it? yes, that's correct. I mean, Barrett's esophagus is something that I uh, forgot to write down. So you is good for pointing that out. So Barrett's esophagus is actually a pre-malignant condition while esophageal malignancy is cancer. So it is malignant. What is Barrett's esophagus is where the squamous is um, the epithelium. You get this velvety appearance. There's transition of the epithelium to a different type of epithelium in the lower esophagus. So when you, where you have the GOJ, which is a gastroesophageal junction, um, the, the, due to the reflux, the, the squamous nature is changed into columnar and it's changed into this velvety appearance that you see on when you do endoscopy. And that's called Barrett's esophagus. Now Barrett's esophagus in itself is not cancer. It's a pre-malignant, i.e. one to 2% of this over time will turn into esophageal lidocrine carcinoma. So that's what Barrett's esophagus is. And it is relatively common in the Western world. And that's related to the diet, alcohol, smoking, uh, esophageal reflux, high BMI. And we have a complete, um, what we call as Barrett surveillance program where people who have got Barrett's esophagus are surveilled. And there's also these hormone secreting tumors of the gut. And this is the VIPOMA, somastinoma, and then your ZE, which is the Zollinger Ellison syndrome. Again, I've done a video on that, so you probably can read one slide or two on that from that presentation rather than describe it here. Um, but what I wanted to highlight is these are very high yield topics, these, the, especially the ones with the names where like Zollinger Ellison, because these are the things that they can test you on in MRCP part one. So for example, they would say, there is a chap who presents with significant amount of pain, Upper GI endoscopy showed that he's got numerous ulcerations and the, the tests are done, which shows that this is ZD, how would you manage it? And whether it's uh, what type of tumor it is and these sort of questions. So it's important to <coughs> focus your time on this rather than the pathophysiology of, 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 of these tumors. So that's important. We'll just move on quickly on to a few more. So again, when we go to the small intestine, it's celiac disease, which, you, uh, as I said, you should concentrate on. Also complications of celiac disease, like lymphoma, the types of celiac disease, that's important. So cystic fibrosis, I mean, we don't see it much, when at least when I was there in India, that you don't see much uh, of cystic fibrosis because it's more of a Western condition, but it's again, very important to read about cystic fibrosis. This is mainly covered in the, should be covered in the respiratory module, but there are GI consequences of cystic fibrosis. So for example, they can have uh, what we call as distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, where because of the villi that don't work properly in cystic fibrosis, they can lead to have constipation. They can also have and intestinal obstruction. They can also have, um, liver fibrosis and cirrhosis sometimes. And obviously they've got the respiratory complications related to cystic fibrosis. Moving on to the GI bleeding. Normally GI bleeding, is, um, there is another module on that, um, which we've done a video. So feel free to have a look at that. But when it comes to GI bleeding, obviously we've got the upper GI bleeding where I was talking about all the important um, um, the scores, the Rockwell and the Glasgow Blatchford scores and how you manage that endoscopically. Lower GI bleeding is mainly symptomatic and supportive treatment. And then um, CT angiography if required to embolize the artery. Rarely surgery even complicated. 
uh, contemplated. But when it comes to small intestine and bleeding disorders, this is very difficult because these don't come under the category of obscure GI bleeding, i.e. that you don't know where the bleeding is coming from. So for example, you um, patient presents with, I don't know, melina or hematochesia, and then the hemoglobin is five. You do an upper GI endoscopy, you can't see anything. Colonoscopy, you do it, you can't see anything, i.e. there's just blood, but you can't find the source. That's when small intestine needs to be investigated. And it's difficult to investigate this endoscopically because the enteroscopy, um, that is the endoscope that is used to look into small bowel is quite difficult uh, to perform. Normally needs a GA and it's difficult to access and you can't even map the whole small bowel. So the most common causes for small intestine bleeding are angiodysplasia. Um, and then, and his treatment is essentially supportive and treating the underlying cause. So for example, angiodysplasia, you would need to do an endoscopy and burn those vessels. You can also consider doing a CT angio if there's any tumors. Um, a capsule endoscopy, um, this is a modality of endoscopy where you ask a patient to swallow a capsule. This has a camera at the end of it. They swallow it and that goes into the stomach and into the small intestine and into the large bowel and then comes out. Patient wears a recorder which receives the images sent from this small capsule. And then you can read it. Um, that will show you where the bleeding is from, if there is bleeding, and then you can target that appropriately. I think it's also important to read up about these two conditions. One is NET, which is neuroendocrine tumor. Another one is GIST, which is gastrointestinal stromal tumor. So these NET and GISTs are relatively uncommon, but prevalent um, tumors. So neuroendocrine tumors, it's important to read about that. GIST, hematemesis, bringing up blood, um, loss of weight, appetite loss, um, so those are the things that are considered as red flag symptoms. And then obviously sudden on um, a resistant esophageal reflux is, an, is another one. So when it comes to esophageal malignancy, the most common <coughs> sorry, is esophageal adenocarcinoma. But you can get esophageal squamous cell carcinoma um, as well, which is less common. Uh, but normally the top end of the esophagus is more prone to um, a squamous cell carcinoma, while the distal part is more for um, <coughs> adenocarcinoma. So the way you diagnose this is, is gastroscopy. You have a look at it. You can obviously do a CT scan to stage it. And then endoscopic ultrasound can be used to um, stage it as well. The treatment is surgery chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and then in cases of palliative, it would be placement of stent. <clears throat> um, another common question in the MRCP is the peptic ulcer disease. So <coughs> peptic ulcer is essentially where you have ulcerations either in the duodenum or in the stomach. Um, this is relatively common. Um, um, sorry. I think I don't think that's fine. Um, so you get ulcerations in the stomach, mostly in the antrum, and also in the duodenum sometimes. If you have ulcerations in the stomach, it's important to rule out this is not malignant or gastric malignancy, um, in which case you need to biopsy these ulcers. You also need to check for H. pylori, and H. pylori is another high yield topic for MRCP. So. When it comes to H. pylori detection, you need to know what H. pylori is, how it's detected, what tests are done, which is more sensitive, which is less sensitive, which is more specific, so on and so forth. Um, treatment for peptic ulcer disease is obviously to prevent complications. You can also get peptic ulcer disease through um, tablets or you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs. Um, and then PPIs or proton pump inhibitors are the treatment of choice. Obviously, if you have bleed, complication of peptic ulcer disease is GI bleeding and um, uh, stricture formation or malignancy. 
So um, a perforation can happen if the ulceration is very deep. So GI bleeding is a whole topic on its own. Um, um, there is a presentation that we've already done, so I hope you've gone through that, which I've done. I think GI bleeding is mainly, um, when it comes to the MRCP, it's a ability to diagnose, knowing all the scoring systems. So you've got the Rockell, the Glasgow, Blatchford, the ABCD score. And all those scores is something that you need to read about. Um, I think if you make notes and just go home and read about those scores, and how much marks or points is awarded to each marker, that will be helpful. Treatment of GI bleeding is essentially, number one is resuscitation, number two is endoscopy, number three is if that fails, then it's interventional radiology. pH 7.25, excellent answer, thank you very much. So a pH of less than 7.3 is a prognostic, poor prognostic factor for this lady. And it's important that this, you know, you know, you do the blood gas where you look at the pH. It's important that you've resuscitated them first because that is um, not just the index one, it's after you've resuscitated them. So what is the criteria for transfer to a specialist unit? So you should have encephalopathy. So that means if they come in confused, that's, a, that, that's something to do. Then the INR more than two at, at less than 48 hours, or if it's more than 3.5, after three, uh, within three days. If the serum creatinine is more than 200 micromoles, if the blood pH is 11, less than 7.3, as is the case in this, in this 7.25, or the BP is less than 80. It's interesting that there's, nothing, there's no mention of um, liver function tests because it's, it, it's, not, um, it's not relevant. Yes, any grade of encephalopathy, if you think they're encephalopathic, you should refer. Um, thanks for that question. Um, something wrong with the slides, it doesn't uh, move. Okay. So, a 39 year old lady with type 1 diabetes for the last four years presents to the endocrine clinic for annual review. She complains of persistent loss of weight over the past few months. Um, she has no menstrual disturbances and her bowel function is essentially normal. On examination, her BMI is 22. Investigations revealed a hemoglobin of 69 and an MCV of 72. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Is it celiacs? Is it anorexia nervosa? Is it Crohn's? Is it beta thalassemia minor? Or do you think it's bacterial overgrowth? Sir, beta thalassemia do you think, minor. You think it's beta thalassemia minor? Okay. Yes. Anybody else? Bacterial overgrowth. Pardon? Bacterial, bacterial overgrowth. overgrowth. Okay. So... This one is actually celiac disease. So the, why is it celiac? Well, celiac is the likely option as this patient has autoimmune disease. You know, they've got type one diabetes. They've got iron deficiency anemia, so MCV 72 and the hemoglobin 69, and little in the way of symptoms. So celiac is variable in this presentation and need not always associated with significantly abnormal bowel habit. Um, so it affects, I think somebody is washing their dishes. Um, Ninety-five percent. Yes, very good, very good answer. Because it's quite um, sensitive. Highly specific. Yeah. Um, so I, okay then. So thank you, Doctor Budhial, for this amazing session, and thank you to our participants, old and new, for attending this session. We will see you all next Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, okay. sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.